wow, I can only say wow, what happened here. It's fantastic. Because in the 50s, my grandfather used to kill slaughter one or two pigs from our small farm in February, in winter. And this was a fantastic day for me as a small boy, because from the hamlet, the people came helping, a lot of uh, noise of activities. But one activity was fantastic. It was a job of the women. This tells you something. It was a job of the women to clean the entrails. What you, uh, you were seeing Dario pulling out, they had to clean it. So they were sitting behind the barn in the chairs in the snow, a, a basket of steaming entrails in front of them, the guts of the pigs, we were chatting, gossiping, scratching off the fat and the other stuff. And then this very magic moment happened. One of the women will take the gut and inflate it. And this transparent, delicate thing would spiral out like a tube into the cold air. Fantastic. Little did I know that actually the most important stuff was crept away. Now, if I tell the story, people say to me, are you interested in entrails? I say, no, in sausages. Because the casing was the important part. Now, what I would like to tell you is a story on entrails and how it has a connection to cooking. Now, you know, you can use stomach, tripa, like Dario say, for cooking. I don't want to talk about this. What I want to talk is what happens after we add, after we chewed and swallowed our food. Now, actually the world is against entrails because the word entrails itself means, from Latin coming, the internal things, that's all. I mean, I'm a native German speaker and uh, the intestine is called Darm. I think in Danish it's similar, which goes back to an old German word which means whole. So I don't know what the old German thought about what kind of ant they were describing with this. And, but what it tells you is simply, Eat it and forget it. Nothing good comes out if you think about it. So there is a hidden story with the relation between cooking and entrails. And when we talk about it, about our own entrails, not the entrails of the pigs, so our own, then we have to start with evolution because human evolution is dominated by our brain. Brains are very expensive. Those of you who have college kids know. Okay. <laughs> But also, metabolically speaking, it's very, very expensive. Because, let me see if I can get this in, yes. Because it makes only, in average, 2% of our body mass, but it uses 25% of the resting energy we have to absorb. So to give you some numbers, a person 75 years old, normal height, normal weight, normal eater, so it's not me, okay? This person, in the lifetime of 75 years, will have absorbed 55 million kilocalories. 12 million from it are only for keeping the brain going. This is 2,000 kilograms of food, 7,000 liters of water to hydrate the brain. It's incredible. And those who are technically interested in you, it's 1,000 liters of kerosene, if you want, in comparison. So, brains are really expensive. Now, if you think about what kind of gut we must have to keep this brain developed, working, then we can take the laws of biology, and they tell us it must be a gigantic gut. Maybe I'm coming close slowly to this, what biology demands, but actually it's not like this. If we do an, um, anatomy, we find that actually our gut is reduced. We have even less fat cells than we should. Don't look at me, please, at this moment. But it is really like this, that we have actually a too small gut for this brain. So let's, let's see the gut. Now, if you stretch it out, if Dario would have stretched out the gut from the peak, it would have a different length. But our, in the body, it's five meter. Outside of the body, it's nine meter. If you take all the protrusions which are on the inside of the gut and you, and you flatten them out, you get a gigantic surface, 4,500 square meter, 5,000 square yards 
Incredible. This is a surface which has so much spare capacity. It can absorb everything. So this surface is not only for absorption, it has to be also defended. Now, not only it has a big surface, this is a very dynamic organ. 70 billion of the epithelial cells you will lose at this very moment, sitting here and listen to me, actually throughout the day. And this has to be renewed. So this is an, it's a turnover. It's churning away in you, and it has a brain. I think most people don't know that we have an autonomous brain in our gut. Actually, it's the older sister of this brain. And it binds us to all the other animals down to the very, very small polyps of um, corals. They all have nervous systems around the digestive tracts. Now, this brain has a very interesting uh, connection. As you all know, it has a connection to emotions. The brain talks with a big one, with a big sister. So, for example, at this moment, my gut brain would uh, say, uh, Sir, what's for lunch? And, uh, and, and the sir would say, Come on, shut up, uh, we have a stress situation here. <laughs> and the gut would answer, OK, let's get the bu uh, butterflies going, you know? And I have a little bit of butterflies going around now in my stomach. Because I cannot help it. The limbic system, the emotional system, is bound directly to this brain. Now, the brain has another job than keeping me emotional, alert, in front of you. It has actually the job to control digestion. So everything what you eat has to be analyzed by this brain. And then the right reaction and the right uh, manipulations have to be uh, chosen from a whole pre-programmed set of different uh, programs which are there. It's actually like a, a kind of com computation, if you want. And then the most important thing, it has actually to defend our surface, our body. 60% of our immune system is concentrated in the gut. And then the biggest job of all, and I think some managers, you know, managers actually think only with this gut brain, so they should learn from it, because this brain is actually managing 10 trillion cells of bacteria in your colon. This is 10 times more than you have cells on your body. So we have to ask the question, are we walking bacteria? Are we only a vehicle for them? So, so you see, we have a paradox. We have this huge energy-demanding brain, and we have a shortened gut. So how do we solve this paradox? Actually, it was solved for us by our ancestors. They invented one of the most profound technology. It's so profound, it's so pervasive, that we even don't recognize it. But it's a very, very broad, uh, if you want, platform on which today and in our future we can still build. Actually, it's cooking. Cooking is this technology. With cooking, you allow the gut to produce the energy which your, which your brain needs. So cooking is a way of releasing the energy. But more than this, it also generates taste. I mean, I don't have to tell you. I mean, it's, it's a story of the taste. And the taste goes directly to our rewarding system. And our rewarding system in the big brain, and the big sister, is here to reinforce our memory. When our ancestors found some very tasty mushrooms, it's better to know where the mushrooms were. Okay? So it's a wonderful technology which not only helps to build the brain, which actually speaks to the brain. So I, I would propose, uh, but sometimes people get angry about this, I would propose that we are actually cocktivores. We are not omnivores. We eat cooked food, and the better so. Once I said, even the philosophers should change their mind. We should say, coco ergo sum. I cook, therefore I am. Because without this cooking, we would not be here. Maybe there would, mad would be madness, but we would not be part of it. Okay? So cooking is a very, very important invention. So important that we have forgotten, actually, to give it the right position within all technologies. Now, when you cook, when you have learned cooking, and you have a large brain, like most, I think, I have. Then you have a, fun, a fantastic feedback loop created. 
This is what actually gastronomical, uh, gastronomical art and technology and food technology and food science is all about. This feedback, because you respond with the senses to this what is cooked. And at the same time, you make choices, you make decisions, you create through your senses, through the expectations of your senses, what the cooking should be. So actually, cooking forces you not only to memorize, it generates also coordination, social interactions. I mean, I have a little dissident uh, idea that actually language came with cooking and not the other way around. Because, I mean, I could imagine that in the prehistoric time, something was cooking and uh, the person cooking hitting the other and said, don't look in the pots, make the table. Yeah? Don't look before I'm finished. Even man started to talk. What's for dinner, honey? <laughs> so I think it's a, it's a very central thing being human is cooking. But I think, as I said before, there is a second part to the story. And the second part is the gut. What does the gut brain have to tell us about cooking? Actually, only negative things. If it didn't work out, if we screw it up, yes, we get bloated, we get pain, we get uh, many different states. So I think it's very important <coughs> to learn about this language. Now, why would it be important? Because the gut is the center of health, and the sister is the center of delight. So we should put things together. We should ask ourselves, what is the taste of health? For this, we have to learn the talk of the gut brain. Now, there are some experiments done which show that uh, in what form you eat food, if you take a normal breakfast, if you throw this breakfast in a blender, make a soup out of it, you will have your body reacts differently. I think this is trivial. What I would propose is to take the very moment where our gut actually learns to do what it has to do, and to see what at this moment the gut has to learn for understanding the world around it. Because you are born in the womb, from the womb of your, mo of your mother. Your gut does not know what to expect outside. It has all the pre-programs, but what program to run? What will be there? Of this beautiful protected area, I get ejected into the cold, dry, bacteria-infested world. So, evolution has found a solution. Do you know what it is, the solution? Hmm? Mother's milk. Milk is actually the only food nature has evolved. Everything else we exploit. We domesticate. We simply take without asking. Milk was developed only for one single reason. And actually, all the milk is mother milk, to be honest. There's only one reason. This is to get the baby a very good start, to put it in a healthy state, to become an adult, to propagate its chains. So milk is a very fantastic liquid. It started 320 million years ago when the ancestors of the mammals split off on the evolutionary tree, and they started to secrete liquids. 160 million years ago, our class, the, the mammifers, the, the mammals, split off because they had a complete secretion system for lactation. Now, milk takes care of everything. Of course, of energy, building blocks, and what you need when you are a baby to build. But our intestine is immature. We are born sterile. There are no bacteria in us. And bacteria are actually life-saving. If you don't have them, you will die. But actually, how do you decide what should be in and what not? So milk controls, provides first every single nutrition, but controls also the health through bioactives. There's a lot. It's a very complex mixture which is produced in the mammary gland of the mother. For me, the most amazing thing is that actually the mother seeds the baby with the right bacteria. Bifidus longum infantis. You need this, because this bacterium provides the ecological niche for a healthy gut flora. The mother is so clever, well, if you want, nature it was so clever, that in the mother milk, there are sugars, which cannot be digested by the mother nor by the baby. 
only by the bifidus longum infantis. So if you breastfeed, and which is a very, very important step and start for a baby, you actually feed also the bacteria in the colon, and you take care that, I mean, I'm speaking of the mothers, of course, you take care that the right bacteria grow. So milk is a fantastic uh, liquid, but I, I would, in relation to entrails, think about what are actually the, the ways how liquid could have been. I mean, milk is a very strange uh, solution. Why it's not a white pool, you know? It's like you come with a can, give the baby, okay? Baby grows, has all the energy. Why is it so complicated made? And to help you a little bit, I have uh, put in an analogy, and the analogy looks like this. Let's take the fat and make it the size of a beach ball. You know, 64 centimeters, 24 inches. If you look then, you see a whole hierarchy of other structures. Lactosomes, which were recently discovered. The casein, which is like a little tennis ball. And it's like a tennis ball because it has hairs on the surface. And then you have this little pea, which is a whey protein. Why the hell is it so complicated? I mean, this has to be assembled in the mammary gland. The beach ball has to be covered by a membrane to stabilize it. So for 100 milliliter of milk, the mother has to provide the membrane for, for two square meter. I mean, the mothers dissolve themselves, literally, into the milk to have this structure made. Now, why is this structure? Because the milk doesn't remain liquid when you eat it. In the baby's stomach, it curds, it makes fresh cheese. So the little tennis balls lose their hair, then stick together, trap the beach balls, and the rest separates from it. What it tells you is actually that milk has built in a self-control of digestion. And it tells you that structure is the language of the gut brain. Because our stomach is a mechanical sensor. And if you make a curd, the stomach senses it. It can exercise fullness, emptiness. If you have an empty stomach, you generate a hormone, ghrelin, which says, I'm hungry. If you have a full stomach, it tells the big boss here, stop eating. In my case, I think it's not always listening, the big boss. <laughs> but it, it talks. It talks with signals of hunger and signals of satiation. And this is because it separates, it sequences its digestion. That we can become healthy humans, that our brain can develop this creativity, is because the milk trains the gut for the world which is a bone, the baby when it grows up. And it trains for providing everything. So I think, I have to give you an example. We, we use goji berries, I don't know if you know them, that is this Chinese orange berries, which are dried and then they're eaten in a soup and a tea. You can eat them with milk, you increase a little bit the absorption of the orange color, which is a very potent an uh, antioxidant, very good for the eye, for the UV stability of your retina. But if you mill these berries together with casein, you generate actually a structure, and this was tested in uh, the University of Hong Kong with porridge, with morning porridge for the people who took part in this study. And you see that we have tripled the absorption of the sixantine, of this antioxidant, because of the presence and the intimacy between the sixantine and the proteins. So coming to the conclusion, I think the entrails being still biased by language, biased by our very strange hygienic frenzy we have with all these fears when we talk about this center of life, if you think, about this structure, this surface. This is what you, what you actually see and how your body actually experiences the environment. I would say, especially to you, because you are the people with the closest intimacy to food, but not only you understand food and you are creative about it, you also understand human psychology. You know what is our envy. You know our desires. If we could learn to understand this language, we would you would have an ocean for new creativity. 
And I think the fermentation, which is now becoming en vogue in the cuisine, I think this is the right way to go. So, to bring it to one sentence, what's the taste of health? Thank you. <laughs>